Nice to see you. Nice to be here. How are you, sweetie? Hi, sis. All right. Well, let me tell you, it's nice to be here. A few months ago, let me put Benji down. Sit down, Benji. A few months ago, Diane said a little prayer, and she said to God, Dear God, is there any chance that you can send Frank in to us for just one day so we can celebrate his 100th birthday? And God said, Diane, you've been a good girl. So, of course, you can have Frank for the afternoon. So here I am, along with Benji, the star of the program. I am so happy to be here to celebrate my 100th birthday with you. See some of my family members. It's going to be a great day. But give me a second to kind of get comfortable here, if you don't mind. Take out my hat. Why not buy myself a new coat for the occasion? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and if you're asking, Frank, do you want some weight? The answer is yes. You see, Oprah, you know who Oprah is, right? Well, she's persuaded God to put a bunch of us on the Weight Watchers program, and I've lost the weight. <laughs> good? So I'm going to tell you about my life, the life of my family here in Morrisville. I was born on May 8, 1916, in Camden, actually on Mendenhall Road. Don't correct me now. <laughs> <laughs> you correct me at the end. <laughs> That's a problem with having family here, you know? You tell a lie and they're right there to correct you. <laughs> we moved at an early age, we moved to what is considered candy. My dad was Ernie Freeman, and my mother was Ada May Freeman. And there were five of us kids. I'm the oldest. And it was hard times, but fun times growing up. My, my dad, both parents actually were Quakers. My dad was a preacher. He also worked in Indianapolis. And back in the day, he used to take the inner urban to work every day. And one day, he was sitting there waiting for the inner urban to show up to take him to, into Indianapolis. And he noticed some wildfires next to the, to the track. And he picked some and brought them into work. Well, the folks at work, they thought those were wonderful. So what happened was they started to, to buy them from my dad. Well, pretty soon he got the bright idea to maybe build himself a greenhouse. And he did. Out of some of the old lumber from a sawmill there in Camden. And pretty soon they were in the flower business. And that's how that all came about. And then later, he moved the family to Mooresville and started the business here. They moved around th three or four times in the Mooresville area and had a, a flower shop. The last, uh, uh, the last shop was on just off 67 there on North Park Drive, just beyond the, the 144 intersection. So I know some of you remember that. And there's some I know some things, flyers in the back to talk about that. And we can talk about that at the end. Well, Dad was a pretty strict kind of guy. And he used to make us go to church on Sunday three times. We always have to sit in the front row. And those, my two sisters there are sitting in the front row. <laughs> and some things never change. And if they, we weren't paying attention, he'd look down at us. Well, I don't know whether it was that or just wonderless being 17 years old. But at 17 years old, I left home. Now, this was in 1933. <clears throat> and I hopped a freight train. Boxcar full of other people that were leaving. It was the Great Depression, the height of the Depression. People were out of work. They were looking for something to do. So we ended up in Georgia. Now, as the train was pulling into this station in Georgia, there had been a murder. 
one of the railroad brakemen had been murdered, and the state police were looking to see who did it. So they pulled us all off the train, and they interviewed each of us to see what we knew about the murder. And they said, if you had a good alibi, you could quit. Well, I didn't have really an alibi. I was more concerned about my parents finding out that I had been part of a, a murder situation. So I didn't tell them my name, and I didn't say where I was from. And they said, okay, you're going to go and be part of a chain gang because we're going to lock you up. And they did for three months. And there I was for three months working on a chain gang. Well, one day, we're out there working on this chain gang. Guy next to me, he had taken one of the spoons and he had carved it down so it looked like a key. And pretty soon, he's sitting down like this and he's unlocking the ball and chain attached to his ankle. And when he finished, he passed it on to the next guy. And pretty soon it came with my turn. And I am unlocked it. And when the guard wasn't looking, we all took off running. Now on the way home, I helped myself to a shirt and a pair of pants in someone's yard. In those days, remember how they used to put the clothes out on the outside to dry? And I got back to Indiana. Well, my parents were very happy to see me. And they hugged and kissed me and my family. Even my sister's here. <laughs> but my dad said to me, he said, Frank, times are tough. We're going to have to, if you're going to stay here, you're going to have to find something to do. Well, a couple days later, he came over to tell me that he knew this farmer who was looking for a farm hand. And so, what they did was they hired this farmer. And it was great because it was a horse farm, but he also had fields that needed plowing. And so I got to, to go out there one day plowing the fields. It was lunchtime, so I found myself in shady trees, sat down to eat my lunch. And I look up, and the horses had the feed bags on. The older one is laying on the ground. She was tired. So I said to myself, well, you know, if she's tired, probably the younger one is as well. Okay, so I said to myself, I'm going to show this younger one how to lay down, too. So I did. Nothing happened. A couple days later, the farmer comes up to me. He's mad. He said, Frank, I know you love animals and horses especially, but he said, I can't have my horses laying down on the job. <laughs> he said, I was out plowing the field, and all of a sudden they just laid down. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> well, that didn't sit too well with me. And of course, I came home, and a day or two later, I decided that maybe take off again a second time. Maybe this time I'd find something better to do. So, I get my suitcase. <laughs> I'm walking down there close to I-40 to hitchhike to California. And I hear this noise behind me. Turn around. It's my dad in his old Model T Ford. <laughs> And he says, son, I really hate to see you go. But he said, if you must, I want you to take something with me. And he handed me the Bible. This is the Bible that he had given me when I was 10 years old. He said, in time of trouble, look to this to help you out. Well, I really didn't want to bring the Bible with me. <laughs> But I wanted to humor my dad, so I put it in my bag, a suitcase, and off I went. I ended up in Idaho, and I spent some time there, and then in California. And at the time, I worked for the Civilian Conservation Corps. That's the program that President Roosevelt created for young guys like me to find some work. But after a while, I was running out of money and I decided to come home a second time. Came home, my 
My father hugged me. Even my sisters hugged me. They were happy to see me. And the first words out of my dad's mouth were, did you read your Bible while you were gone? <laughs> I said, of course, Dad. <laughs> In fact, here, here it is. Take it. <laughs> yeah, here it is, Dad. Right here. <laughs> my dad took the Bible and he opened it up. And he started reading. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. John 3.16. That was my dad's favorite verse. And he handed the book back to me. And there was something in it. It was a $10 bill. My dad had put a $10 bill in the Bible. And of course, I didn't. <laughs> so I had really read my Bible. <laughs> but from that day forward, I did. And that's how my early life started. Well, a few weeks after that, that visit home, I decided to take off again. So this is the third time I left home. And I hitchhiked to California. Well, I was fortunate that I was able to get a job working at a horse farm that had a riding stable. And one day I'm out there riding, and I look ahead, and there's a guy on a horse, and the horse is headed straight for the road. And I'm thinking to myself, I've got to do something about that, or that, that gentleman's going to have problems. So I got, a, got a, I was on my horse, charged off, I was able to around that horse, that runaway horse. And the man on the horse was so grateful that he offered me a job. Well, it turns out he was an executive at MGM Studios. And so he gave me a job working at MGM Studios, cutting, putting, tearing down some of the, the scenery from the movies that they would make. And it was a pretty good job, and I was really enjoying it. Well, one night, late one night, I'm driving home, and all of a sudden, BAM! Somebody T-boned me as I was driving in my car. The ambulance came, they picked me up, put me on a stretcher, took me to the hospital. And the emergency room physician took one look at me, he said, this guy's dead. So they wheeled me off to the morgue. Now, it turns out in the morgue, there were a bunch of mortician students. They were waiting for their instructor to find out how they were going to embalm me. <laughs> okay? Well, one of them was a little curious, and he walked over to me and he looked, and he said, This guy's alive. Sure enough, I was. <laughs> so they hauled me back to the emergency room, <coughs> and for the next two years, I was recuperating. Now, a good friend of mine put me up at his house. And for two years, I spent in a wheelchair, working, not being able to work. So for fun, they decided to, they found this stray dog. And they thought that would be a good companion for me during this time. And that's, it turned out he was. I called the dog Jeep after a cartoon character at that time. And I would sit in that wheelchair, and if the dog would come up to me, and I would pet him, and pretty soon I was teaching him how to do a few little tricks. So when I got better, I went back to work at MGM Studios. Now one day, I'm working away, cleaning up around the studio, and I'm watching a guy named Henry East. Now Henry was a famous animal trainer at that time. And Henry was the man who trained Asta, the dog that was the dog in the Thin Man movies, you may be called. Some of the older folks you may be called. Well, whatever it was 
was going on, Henry couldn't get asked him to do this particular trick. And the trick was the dog had to run upstairs, run into a bedroom, jump up on the bed, and get underneath the covers. Okay? For some reason, he couldn't quite make that last part work. So I tapped Mr. East on the shoulder and I said, oh, my dog can do that trick. He said, I don't believe you. I said, well, let me show you. Now, my dog used to follow me to work and wait for me outside the studio. So I went up and I got him and then brought him back in. And sure enough, my dog, Jeep, did the trick. Well, Mr. East was so excited that I was able to do that, that he hired me on the spot. And I was making five dollars a week, big time money. And that's how I got into the animal training business. And I worked for Mr. East for several years. And then I went to work for a second animal trainer who was well known, and a lot, I'm sure a lot of you remember. His name was Rudd Weatherwax. Now, Rudd and his family were from, were from New Mexico. They moved to California. His brother was a movie actor, but Rudd was the trainer for Lassie. Well, I spent several years working with Rudd and then working with his son Bob, and then Bob worked for me later on, working on. Last few movies, and that was a great, great experience, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. By this time, it's the late 1940s, and I decided to get married. And I met this beautiful young woman named Juanita Hurd. We got married in 1946. And then next year, the first of our children, Kathleen, came along, and I decided to go out on my own. And it was Kind of frightening at first, but it ended up being pretty good. I was able to, to, to get some luck right out of the box with a, a cat named Rhubarb in a movie about a cat inheriting a baseball team. Kind of a silly plot, but nevertheless, it was a great movie. <coughs> and Orange and the Cat, and you all may remember Jackie Cooper from the Little Rascal series. Well, Jackie had a, movie, a TV show in the early 50s. It started a dog named Bernadette. The name of the show was Cleo. And Cleo would talk, sort of like a Mr. Ed. And that was, that was my dog and, and my training. So life was, was pretty good. And it was throughout the 50s. Now, under the 60s, that was probably the pinnacle of my career in terms of working with animals on, on TV. And I really, a gentleman named Paul Henning was responsible for making that my career really take off in the 60s. Paul <coughs> was from Independence, Missouri. And the story goes that he once met President Truman and asked him, Mr. President, what do you think I should do about my career? And supposedly the president said, go get a lawyer. <laughs> okay? I suppose he could have said, go open a clothing store, but he didn't. Because that's what Harry did before he became president. He went off to all went out to Kansas City. He got his law degree, but he wasn't too happy about being a lawyer. In fact, he was a pretty darn good singer, and he was an even better comedy writer. So he moved to Chicago and he worked for Vipper McGee and Molly, and later he worked for George Burns and Gracie Allen. And he ended up in California actually working for Burns and Allen when they went from radio to their TV show. By the 60s, he had become the executive producer of three of the top comedies of that decade. And I, break in, was the trainer, animal trainer for all three of those shows. That was quite an honor and a lot of fun. I'll tell you a little story about the Mooresville connection to Pentecost Junction, or excuse me, to Green Acres. Those of you who remember, this, really the star of that show was Arnold the Pig. <laughs> it wasn't Eddie Albert or Zsa Zsa's sister, the Gamora sister, Ava. Ava. Thank you. It was Arnold the Pig. And guess where Arnold came from? Right here in Mooresville, folks. That's right. 
He was raised on a farm that belonged to Jim Clement, out there, off of Landersdale Road, right behind, I believe it's a subdivision now, right behind uh, the hospital. Well, that was great. I was home, went out there, saw Jim, picked up my pig, and took him back to California. Now, the problem with Arnold was over the course of the TV season, he grew. <laughs> so he went from about maybe 20, 30 pounds to 600 pounds. <laughs> well, when you're 600 pounds, you're not cute and cuddly, right? So I called up my brother Bob, sitting back here. And Bob, I said, Bob, I need another pig. So Bob went back out to see Jim. Jim gave him a pig. The problem was, Bob was in a position to drive the pig to California. So he had to ship him. So he worked up a, a box, put the pig in the box, convinced my airlines, and I still know how he did that, Bob. <laughs> to take that pig and ship him out to California. Well, that was quite a job, according to Bob. Now, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. So after that, we, we just got the pigs from a farm out in California. Now, the Beverly Hillbillies, people ask, all ask me, because it's, the show was on TV for, for like nine seasons, and it was like the top rated show for many of those years. It's a great show. One of the premises of the show was Ellie May, who was one of the actresses on the show, a beautiful woman named Don Douglas. She was the, she was the niece of Jed Clamp, the master of the house. And Ellie May loved animals, or she liked to call them critters. We ended up having, over those nine seasons, something like 600 animals on the show. People often said to me, well, what was, what was the most memorable episode? Well, there were so many, it was tough. But here's one that I think you might enjoy. In this particular episode, Ellie May was supposed to ride a hippo in their cement pond. This was a heated swimming pool out in the backyard of the mansion. And believe it or not, at that time, I owned a baby hippo whose name was Herman. <laughs> now, the only problem with Herman was he wouldn't go anywhere without his faithful companion and friend, Lisa, who was a baby elephant. So here we go, trying to imagine this. We get ready for this scene. So myself and my crew, we go over here, we get Lisa, the baby elephant. We bring her over and we put her in the pool. And then we go back over here and we get Herman. And we bring Herman over and we put him in the pool. Now, it was a, did I tell you it was a heated pool? The minute those two were in that pool, nature took over. <laughs> And that beautiful sky blue pool became a putrid green color. <laughs> so, you take Lisa out of the pool, you take Herman out of the pool, and we try to skim that pool to get rid of that green color. It didn't work. So then we found some blue dye put the blue dye in the pool, stirred it up with some oars, and finally, we, we thought we had a pretty good color to go ahead and see. So somebody went and got Donna Douglas from her room, where she was, waiting for us. And she came out, and she said, oh my, what a beautiful blue color that is. I didn't want to tell the poor thing that what had gone on, so I said, Made up some story about how hippos like good, clear, blue water or something to swim in. She bought this story, but lion sent her. She jumps in the pool, gets on top of poor old Herman, and we film the episode. Now, the next day, I'm sitting there in the MGM studio cafeteria, enjoying my lunch, and all of a sudden, Somebody hits me on the back of my shoulder. I turn around and it's Ellie May. So what's the matter with you? 
She said, you didn't tell me what had gone on yesterday. She hits me again. People just can't take a joke. <laughs> All right. In the early 70s, my life changed rather dramatically. And I really went from television because those shows that we just talked about really were canceled by the early 70s. And as I say, my life changed, and another person who really kind of was instrumental in making that change was a guy named Joe Camp. Now, Joe was born in St. Louis, Missouri. And Joe claims that at an early age, he wanted to be in the film business. But his parents weren't too happy about that idea. So they compromised, and poor Joe ended up in University of Mississippi studying business. He wanted to go to UCLA Film School. Well, he got out of film school, and he and a couple of buddies moved to Dallas, Texas, and he opened up an advertising agency. But Joe never lost the idea about being in the film business. He and his two buddies, they would write these TV scripts, and then they'd go out to Hollywood and try to sell them to different producers of TV shows. And one of the guys that they were very close to settling on a deal was Dick Van Dyke. Or not Dick, but his brother, Jerry Van Dyke. But nothing really came up. Well, one day, Joe's watching the Disney movie, Lady and the Tramp. And he's thinking to himself, wouldn't it be cool if I could make a movie that featured an animal, a dog, and that I would do the story from the dog's perspective. And so he wrote a script, and then he was able to convince some of his Texas millionaire friends <clears throat> to fund them for this movie. Now he decides he's coming to Hollywood to find a dog to star in his movie. Okay? So he goes around and visits all the animal trainers. Then he finally came to me. And he's looking around my farm, looking at all the animals, and so on. And all of a sudden, he looks, he said, that's him. That's the dog I want. Well, Benji at that time was not called Benji. He, he his real name was Higgins. And he was the dog who had the great title in the TV show, Petticoat Junction. He was called Dog. <laughs> creative. And he, you recall from that show, he used to chase, he used to chase the train at the end of the, of the show. He also liked to play checkers with Uncle Joe. One of the characters. I don't know if he ever won. I can't remember whether he ever won. That's what he did. Joe says, I want that dog. Well, part of the problem was, poor Benji was old. He was about 12 years old at the time. I, I found him back in 1960 at the Burbank Animal Shelter. So I had a good friend there. And I always used to tell him, look, if you see any kind of interesting animals that are up for adoption, let me know. And he did. And that's how Higgins came to be part of my menagerie of animals. Could I take you and I was afraid that he couldn't, set up wasn't going to be able to, to make a movie. But Joe was very persuasive. You good? Okay. And Joe made me an offer, ladies and gentlemen, that I could not refuse. <laughs> so two days later, Benji and I are on a plane to Dallas, Texas, and we made the movie Benji. And it was filmed right there in, in Texas. The plot was Benji was rescuing two kids that had been kidnapped and were in this sort of haunted house, a big old mansion. That was a great movie. It came out in 1974. It was like the third top movie of that year in terms of gross sales. The top one was Jaws, which was hard to beat. But you remember I talked to you about how he wanted, Joe wanted it filmed from a dog's perspective, right? Well, let me show you what that meant. Come here, Benji. I'm going to put Benji down here. I'm going to use my lunch. 
So, in order to get the story done from Benji's perspective, I, who at that point was weighing about 300 pounds, I had lots of weight, had to get down like this. Down on my stomach, like this. And behind me, hovering over me, was the cameraman. And so any instructions I gave Benji were from this position. So I had to move back like this. And that's how we filmed that. Oh, I'm oh, oh, That's how we filmed that. That movie. But as I said, come on, Benji. It was very popular. We went on. The second one we made was called The Love for the Love of Benji. No one was great because we filmed it in Greece. And Benji and I got to travel to Greece. And then from there, to help promote the movie, because by that time, Benji had become an international phenomenon. We traveled to all parts of Europe and Japan. Back there in the back, you'll see a flyer of us in Japan. In all, Joe Camp made seven movies starring Benji. Now the problem was, I, I skipped this point. Before the second movie started, Benji passed away. Remember I told you he was kind of old. So what we did was we used his daughter, Ann Jean, and she was the star of the second movie. And later on, Joe used another dog, and Ann Jean got just too old to be in the movie. But it was a phenomenal experience, maybe a lot of money, which I was thankful for. And it was, it was fun. And Crazy Joe, he also made this real uh, funny movie called Humps. There's a couple of photos back there at the back. This is a movie about Civil War soldiers who ended up somewhere out west riding camels. Doesn't make a lot of sense. But I, I got to be in the movie myself. And I was the, the cook, and I loved the part. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to sit down in this last part because I'm 100 years old tomorrow. And I'm a little tired. Oh, so let me bring this chair over here. And while I think about my career, I'm really happy with what went on over the years. I was, I was fortunate enough with my animals, Orangey, Benji, and Tramp from the My Three Sons movie, or TV show, rather, to win what was known as the Patsy Awards. Now, Patsy stands for Performing Animals Top Stars of the Year. And over the years, beginning in the 1950s through 1984, I won 40 of those awards. Now, they were considered the Oscars or the Emmys, the equivalent of those for animals. So I was very fortunate. I was also very fortunate that the American Humane Association inducted Benji into its Hall of Fame. Only the second animal to go into that Hall of Fame, the first one being Lassie. And I was also the first inductee into the International Association of Canine Professionals. This is a group that, of animal trainers. <coughs> and they honored me by making me the first induct inductee into their Hall of Fame. It was a tremendous honor. Now, as you probably heard, throughout this story about my life, but my family was very important to me, and I hope it happened to me as well. But you'll hear from them in a minute, and they may have some other ideas about that. The family used to come up and visit me in California practically every year. We had a lot of fun. They stayed right on my property, up my ranch, and we would go fishing and go see all the Hollywood stars and all that kind of good stuff. 
And Benji and I and some of the other animals will come back to Mooresville on a pretty regular basis. And well, it was pretty nice being back here, especially when Benji started making movies. Uh, we became pretty popular, and we would come back. One year, he and I were the Grand Marshals in the Indianapolis 500 Parade. We were also in the Fall Foliage Festival Parade down in Martinsville one year. And not to be outdone, we were the Marshals in the uh, Mooresville Old Settlers Parade one year. And those good folks at Mooresville High School made me an honorary graduate of one year. I'd actually graduated from Cater Central High School, but that was a nice honor to receive as well. It was a lot of fun. And as time went on, I think probably one of the, the saddest days of my life was on January 1st, 1996. Now, normally New Year's Day is a joyous day, but that day wasn't. And the reason why was that was the day my wife, Juanita, passed away. Now, Juanita and I had been married for almost 50 years at that point. And she was more than just a mother or the mother of my three children, our three children. She was a really a partner in my animal training business. And we worked together over those years to be a success. And I really missed her. After she passed away, I spent some of my years <coughs> collecting memorabilia. Some of that is at the back of the room that you're welcome to look at after. And I started writing poetry. And what I thought I would like to do today is finish this presentation by reading one of my poems. Mm -hmm. And you know, at 100, your eyes start to go. So I gotta use my reading glasses here. And I like to read you this little poem. <clears throat> it's called My Gift to Jesus. And it was written just after Juanita died. And it goes like this. If someone had given baby Jesus a dog that was as loyal as mine, to sleep by his side and follow him and feel like he was divine, as he grew into manhood, he'd have a dog following him every day as he preached to crowds, or if he went into the garden to pray. It's so sad that Christ went away to face death alone and apart, with no dogs close behind him to help comfort his master's heart. When Jesus arose that Christmas morn, how happy he would have been if the little dog licked the hand of the man who died for all men. Our Lord has won now as he just called for my popular dog, Benji. Later, God called for my wife. And now they are both in eternity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I don't know about you, but I thought Frank was really here. My wish came true. So, David Reddick. <laughs> my baby brother.
No, he's, you know, he, that's not true. I mean, I spent hours with this man listening to these stories. He just doesn't want to talk about them. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you. because he had Benji and had him do tricks and he had a big book of poems and he read us a, a whole bunch of those and I think we were there for like three or four hours and I think he said that um, he had trained a bear and I know, know there was a lot of different things he had trained but he had some of them cremated and had their ashes there. But it was really neat getting to see him in person, and he wanted us to actually stay all day, but it was really great that we got to see him, and my kids were smaller, and they remember that. Okay. That's a nice story. And yeah, Frank was very generous with his time. Now, that lady mentioned the ashes. Bob, should we tell him that story or not? Okay. <laughs> Well, this is the one thing that I wasn't able to find out conclusively. But when Frank, the, the idea was that Frank wanted to be buried with his pets, and specifically Benji and a couple others. And so this lady was right that when these, these animals passed away, they were cremated, and Benji, or excuse me, the, the animals were going to be buried with Frank. Now, Frank is buried in Forest Lawn Cemetery in California. 
and the story goes that after Frank passed away, they were going to, family was going to, specifically, I guess his daughter, was going to put the ashes in the coffin with Frank. Forrest Vaughn folks heard about it. And they said, no, you're not going to be able to do that. Now, there is some people that talk about the family did it anyway. And there's some who say, no, it didn't happen. So I don't really know. And you can see these family members of mine. Nobody's talking. Or nobody's talking. <laughs> didn't say nothing. <laughs> One of those deals. So we don't know. Let's say right. knowing the sisters, the daughters, they probably have to. Knowing the daughters of Frank, it probably happened. <laughs> but I don't want to get into a fight here. This is a wonderful day about whether or not that happened. But that's one of the many stories. I, I first, I'll get out of character here for a second. I first learned about Frank a couple of years ago when Bob, especially, and, and, and his sisters, and a couple of the Betty were, were generous enough to give Bill who runs the, the Academy Museum, access to some of the, the material. And they put up, we put on a, a, they put on a show at, at the Academy one Saturday. Well, I got there early that day. And not a lot of people had shown up by that point. They got talking to that guy back there, that Bob. And honestly, God, that guy can tell stories. Now, he's just maybe shy today, but he wasn't shy that day. <laughs> And I fell in love with the Frank Inn story. And then one thing led to another. We're doing this bicentennial thing. And I said to Diane, you know, even though he was born in Camden, he really considered Morrisville his home. And it would be a shame if we didn't include Frank in the, in the program. So I went back to, to Bob and Jackie and then met their great cousin over here, Margaret Jane, who has all kinds of material about Frank and spent hours with them, learning more about them, and then also doing my own research on the internet. And so what you have today was really a compilation of some of the stories about Frank. Some of them, I don't know. <laughs> but they're great stories, and he, he obviously was a great man. I, I know his story that I, I never got the opportunity to, to meet him. But I am so glad you all came out today. And I'm excited about it. Inez coming out, sweetie. <laughs> I had not met Inez before, and I'm so happy that, that you came out. What I want to do, and I'm willing to do this now that I'm back in costume, is take photos with anybody who wants to take a photo. But first of all, I want to have the one with the family. And why don't we do it up here next to this photograph? This, this by the way, sits normally in the government center, uh, Mooresville Government Center on Harrison Street. And they were generous enough to let us use it. So why don't we come up here and get one first with a family. And then if anybody else wants to have one taken, I'm more than happy to take one with you. Okay? And he wants to get the mileage out of that new check. That's right. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not like a rental. <laughs> I own this check. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And your pay for today is in John 3. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get that out of here. <laughs> this old Bob will probably uh, take my Bible off. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>